I'd like to welcome all uh, listeners back to the fourth section of the um, uh, fourth section of the fourth installment of the analysis of James Joyce's Ulysses by uh, County Galway playwright uh, John Ruane. That's me. That's spelled Ruane. R U A N E. Um, this recording is coming from the village of Monave, which is approximately six miles from at the town of Athenry. Uh, four or five miles from the Turlock Moor and about five miles from the village of Eminac um, um Anybody uh, that would be familiar with Galway City, uh, there's a road called the Monave Road that leads all the way out to the village of Monave. So if anybody there in, in uh, that neck of the woods, uh, feel free to call into uh, uh, drop into the village of Monave here. It's a very lively place all, all weekend, as also is um, the village of Eminac Mai and the town of Athenry, and also all 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 areas in in uh, the parish of Turlock Moor. Um, all these areas are really would be steeped in the arts here, uh, um, like traditional Irish music, Irish dance, and you know very lively uh, pubs at the weekends. You know Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights would be. Will be a hive of acti- activity with storytelling. Um, you know, live live bands. You know, country and western music would be very big in these areas too. As also, as I've mentioned before, traditional Irish music and Irish dancing, and the art of shani- uh, You know, shani- uh, storytelling as well would be huge in all these areas. Um, uh, a thing called recitations, which recitations is in simple language. It's it's like you know somebody would you know. You'd be drinking away in the pub, and somebody would get up and you know say a, you know a, a recitation, which would be it's basically a long poem that could last for fifteen and uh, or or twenty minutes or ten minutes, depending. It's just basically a story. It's like a poem. Um, you know, the ballad of the shooting of Dan McGee and the ballad of the what is the shooting of Dan McGee and the ballad of uh, there's a couple of uh, very famous recitations you would hear in all these areas. Um, the shooting of Dan McGee and the ballad of Dan McCrew would be two of would be two of the more well known recitations you'd hear in all these pubs. Uh, generally, these areas would be they wouldn't be part of the whole tourist system here in the west of Ireland. But this really is the lifeblood of of uh, of the real Ireland. You but you know you'll meet the real Irish people there, but uh, you know with no no frills as they say like but very friendly very friendly people in all these areas and all these areas that would be steeped as i said before in like medieval history like uh you know or r- you know ruined round towers um uh going back to the time of the vikings and the normans when they were here you know throughout irish history and you know there's many ruined castles and actually many um many many castles that have been restored in all these areas as also there's be a lot of you know ruined you know catholic churches and also ruined uh, protestant churches uh, you know in all these areas as well like and uh, i mean some of these are a sight to behold is such unbelievable architecture going back for hundreds and if not thousands of years and all these areas would be there's so many hidden uh, treasures to be explored and you know they really should be on the the tourist uh, the tourist maps, um, because this is really where the real Ireland. Uh, you know, it's all these villages on this side of Galway. Um, you know, the village of Newbridge there as well comes springs to mind. You know, Min- another village called Minla. Um, you know, a lot of villages like that undiscovered, but you know, just the real. That's where you re- meet the real Irish people, and you get a real kid meet of watch, as I say, welcome. Um, also, Loch Ray is another place. Uh, uh, fantastic lake up there in Loch Ray and many, many, many pubs and you know fantastic fishing up there in Loch Ray, of course. Crowell, uh, another area, you know, Clearing Bridge, all the areas, and also Cairn Moor, which is not too far from Galway City, is another vibrant place full of historical sites and so on. All this theory of Galway is just is and, and fantastic scenery as well. So if anybody ever gets a chance to uh, venture out them directions, uh, they'll get a f- huge welcome, no doubt. So, um, before I go into Ulysses now, just another one minute I'm going to, uh, we'll dive into Ulysses again. Um, uh, yeah, okay, why is we going to right now? Um, we're up to page 85, which is, 85 is, 85 I have marked on, on my book here, um, 
as I said before many times, it would be a good idea if listeners could um, read ahead five or six pages yeah, before you know, sitting down and listening to me and no doubt they'll be thrown completely off. <laughs> um, but it's only when you read on your own and you really get, you know, you it really becomes more, the picture has become a lot clearer and the book becomes more alive, as they say. So I'm at page 85 and we stopped at, I'll just read the previous paragraph. And as I said before, this is a, you know, a raw and uncut version. There's not no airs and graces about this recording here. So you may hear, you know, sighing and deep breaths and whatnot, and I, for that I apologize for all that. Um, so we were at, okay, the last line was, what's wrong now? The carriage, I should read a few previous lines to lead in. Didn't the screen, didn't the screen round her bed for her to die? Nice young student that was dressed. Nice young stu student that was dressed that bite the bee gave me. He's gone over to the lying in hospital, they told me, from one extreme to the other. Uh, the carriage galloped round a corner, stopped. Uh, what's wrong now? So that's where we finished. Um, that's where we finished now. And so we'll just continue on. Um, reading, uh, re reading on. A divided drove of branded cattle past the windows, low, lowing slouching by on padded hooves, whisking their tails slowly on their clotted bony croups. Outside, th outside them and through them rattled sheep, bleating their fear, immigrants, Mr. Power said. Ho! The drover's voice cried. He switched, sounding on their flanks. Ho! Hot out of that! Thursday, of course, tomorrow's killing day, springers. Cuff sold them about uh, 27 quid each. For Liverpool, probably roast beef for all England. They buy up all the juicy ones, and then the fifth quarter is lost. All that raw stuff hide. Here, horns comes to a big thing in the year: dead meat trade by pro by products of the slaughterhouses for tanneries, soap, margarine. Wonder is that dodge. Wonder if that dodge works now, getting dicky meat off the train at Clancilla. The carriage moved on through the drove. So just going over that, um, this actually next five or six pages is not that is not that difficult to understand, but there's a lot of, I think there's a few things that may uh, uh, I'd like to point out as I say. So what's wrong now? Okay, so the carriage galloped around the corner, stopped. So just visualize that carriage galloping around the corner with the four people inside it, and then it stopped. And one of the occupants said, "What's wrong now?" <laughs> Probably impatient when he said that. Um, Either Merton Cunningham or one of the other people said it. Right. A divided drove of branded cattle past the windows. So visualize a divided drove of cattle. So here we have a herd of cattle, you know, coming along the street here and it's coming against the carriage. That's the reason the carriage stopped. It sounds very simple, but it was very what's what I think is important here is a divided drove. Why is it a, div a divided drove? It's a drove of the cattle. Uh, so why is it divided? It's divided with a simple reason. Half, half, half the cattle went on the left side of the carriage, and the other half went on the right side of the carriage. See the preciseness of Joyce's writing again. There, a divided drove of cat, a branded cattle, branded. They're branded with the brands, um, you know, from the owner, you know, whatever. A branded cattle past the windows, lowing, slouching by on padded hooves. Slouching by on padded hooves, padded hooves. I'm not sure padded hooves. I was trying to figure out why. Why does Jai say padded hooves? Um, now they don't. We know cattle don't have horseshoes like horses. You know, if he said padded hooves with the horses, you say okay, they're padded because the horses wear horseshoes. But cattle don't wear. Don't wear. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they don't wear horseshoes as such shoes as such, you know, kettle shoes, whatever. So why do they call them padded hooves? That's just, you know, something they are now to think about. Uh, whisking their tails slowly on their clotted bony crops. So their whole, you know, behinds are clotted with you know what. Whisking their tail. You can visualize clearly there their, whi their tails whisking, you know, flies away and whatnot. That's just excellent imagery from Joyce oh, again. Outside them and through them ran. Outside them and through them ran rattle sheep. So also here we have sheep. The sheep mingled among these cattle. So outside them, the sheep are running outside them, and they're running also running through them. So 
outside them and outside them and through them ran rattled sheep rattled sheep uh, rattled sheep rattled sheep rattled means they also have a, got a mark like uh, cattle would be branded they would have a mark uh, a ra um, a rattled would mean it's usually red or blue it's like it's um, how would I describe this now any any sheep you see like a red mark it's, it's something it wouldn't be similar to chalk something like that and they'd rub it on so each owner would, would know which sheep are his some would be red blue and different colors so rattled that's what rattled means it's the brand on, on the on the wool of the sheep now outside them and through them ran rattled sheep bleating their fear that's great that's great writing them guys bleating their fear so these sheep and also cattle are very frightened because they're in they're now they're in the city and they're all came from the country obviously and they're you know bleating their fear so they're all they're all frightened you can you know visualize all that bleating but bleating their fear is that's great writing as such you know and next line immigrants mr power said so mr power called them immigrants why did he call them immigrants um uh, he called them immigrants because they're about to immigrate to uh, to England, actually, uh, as we'll read on and we'll find out. So he called them immigrants. They're about to be s shipped off to England. That's why he called them immigrants. Ho! Oh, the drover's voice cried. So the drover is the is the owner of these cattle and sheep, whatnot. Um. So this is the you know ho. Oh, this is how he's. <laughs> this is the language he's using to. That's exactly what they would say here with driving cattle or cows or sheep. They say, ha, how is that? Ha, the driver, the drover's voice cried. He switched sounding on their flanks. Her he switched. Little stick. Uh, we come across the word switch before in the earlier on the story. The peels, uh, unpeeled switch. Uh, his switch, uh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a little stick, like a, a thin piece of a branch that he uses, you know, just to, you know, herd the cattle with sounded on their flanks he's giving them little tips along ha <laughs> out of that so next line thursday of course tomorrow is killing day so this is leopold bloom thinking here again uh thursday of course so now we know today is thursday um thursday of course tomorrow is killing day so tomorrow is killing day they're going to be all killed tomorrow springers these kettles are springers um i'm not sh exactly sure what springers are i should know this because you know, I was really, I really come from a country area in Monavay here, and uh, there's a lot of uh, huge farming community around Monavay, and I would have known that, but I've just forgotten. Uh, springers, um, springer, uh, young cattle, I would say. Uh, Cuff sold them, Cuff sold them about twenty-seven quid each. So, someone that sells cattle, his surname is Cuff. He sold them for twenty-seven quid each. So cattle in them times in the early 1900s were 27 quid each, 27 pound each, pretty cheap. Um, for Liverpool probably, so Leopold Bloom is still thinking here for Liverpool. So there these cattle and sheep are going to be shipped off to Liverpool. Roast beef for old England. So they're going to England. They buy up all the juicy ones. Um, they buy, in, I mean in England buys up all the juicy ones. And then the fifth quarter is lost. So now he's thinking about every cattle that, sh that it would be killed. The one fifth of that cattle would be lost. Um, and then the fifth quarter is lost. Like all the raw stuff, like the hide, the hair, the horns. And he's now he's thinking, but it, all, it, it adds up a lot. comes to a big thing in a year. So in a year, this will come to a lot. Dead meat trade. This is what he's thinking. Dead meat trade. Buy products of the slaughterhouses for tanneries, soap, margarine. So all this stuff, you know, all this leftover stuff is used in soap and margarine. I think everybody knows that kind of. Wonder if that dodge, I wonder if that dodge works now getting dicky meat off the train at Clancilla. So Leopold Bloom is still thinking here. And once upon a time, uh, there was some kind of a scam going where you would, could buy cheap meat um, off a train, you know. Uh, at Clancilla. I wonder if that dodge, that scam, works now getting dicky meat off the train at Clancilla. Getting meat cheap, it could be possibly stolen or something along them lines. Moving on. The carriage moved on through the drove. So the carriage moved on and the cattle are still on the left hand side. You can visualize that pretty clearly. Reading on. I can't make out why the corporation doesn't run a tram line from the park gate to the quays. 
Mr. Bloom said all those animals could be taken in trucks down to the boats. Um, instead of blocking up the thoroughfare, Merton Cunningham said, quite right, they ought to. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, and another thing I often thought is, another thing I often thought is to have municipal funeral trams like they have in Milan, you know, run the line out to the cemetery gate, gates and have special trams, hearse and carriage and all. Don't you see what I mean? Oh, that be damned for a story, Mr. De Dallas said, Pullman care and saloon dining room. A poor lookout for Corny, Mr. Power added. Why, Mr. Bloom asked, turning to Mr. De Dallas, wouldn't it be a wouldn't it be more decent than galloping to a breast? Well, there's something in that, Mr. Dallas granted, and Merton Cunningham said, we wouldn't have scenes like that when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's and upset the coffin on the road. That was terrible, Mr. Powers. Mr. Powers. Shock face said, and the corpse fell about the road terrible. First round Dumphy's, Mr. De Dallas said, nodding, Gordon Bennett cop. So, come over, reading over that again. Uh, the carriage uh, moved on through the drove of cattle. I can't, no, Ma Leopold Bloomer said this. I can't make out why the corporation doesn't run a tram line. The corporation, like the government, doesn't run a tram line from the park gate to the keys. From the park gate to the keys, probably from, you know, where to sell these cattle, f from there to right down to the boats, to the keys. Mr. Bloom said, all those animals could be taken in tracks down to the boat. Taken, or sorry, all those animals could be taken in trucks down to the boat. Yeah, you know, instead of bringing them on the street. Pretty good idea, probably. Instead of instead of blocking up the thoroughfare, Merton Cunningham said, "Quite right, they ought to." You know, so that's pretty. Yes. Um, next line, Mr. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, and another thing, I often thought. Uh, yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Another thing I often thought is to have muni municipal funeral trams like they have in Milan, you know, run the line out to the cemetery gates and have special trains, hearse and carriage and all. Don't you see what I mean? <laughs> so, um, uh, do 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 Mr. Bloom, you know, he's more saying we should have government funeral trams like they have in Milan, run the line out to the cemetery gates. Uh, and there were special trains, horse and carriage and all, don't you see? Oh, that be damned for a story, Mr. Dallas said. Pullman care and saloon dining room. So Mr. Dallas has got a bit kind of angry here. He said, oh, will you, s will you be quiet to stop saying that? He'd more said, oh, that be damned for a story. And then he said, what do you want? Pullman cares and saloon and dining room scares as well. He's, sa he's saying it's a ridiculous uh, thing. Um... Next line, a poor lookout for Corny, Mr. Power said. A poor lookout for, so Corny Keller is, is Corny Keller the person that's this, um, that he is supplying these carriages? A poor lookout for Corny, Mr. Power added. Uh, something along the lines that wouldn't, Cor Corny Keller wouldn't like this or something. Why, Mr. Bloom asked, turning to Mr. Dallas, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more decent than galloping to a breast? Wouldn't it be a more decent thing, you know? Bringing these straight up beside bringing them in, galloping two abreast, beside bringing them in carriages with two horses, two abreast. Well, there's something in that, Mr. Dallas. Uh, well, there's something in that, Mr. Dallas, granted. And Merton Cunningham said, we wouldn't have scenes like that when the, he when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's and upset the coffin onto the road. So Merton Cunningham has said this, you know, once upon a time a hearse, you know, capsized out, uh, out onto the road when they turned the corner at Dumphy's. And the coffin come out on the road. Uh, that was terrible, Mr. Power shock face said. And the cops fell about the road. Terrible. <laughs> the cops fell about the road. Terrible. <laughs> so we're entering uh, Jace's humour again here. Um, um, first round Dumphy's, Mr. Dallas said, nodding. Gordon Bennett Cup. Now, you see here now, uh, Mr. Dallas said, first round Dumphy's. So, when... Mr. Dallas heard Dumphy's. Now, Dumphy's here is a pub. So he, he if I was to guess, Dumphy's is a pub. I'm uh, reading back the previous line. Like when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's. So when this uh, carriage was, go uh, was going around Dumphy's, which is probably a pub, the coffin come out on the road. So as soon as Mr. De Dallas heard Dumphy's, he said, first round Dumphy's. After this... Uh, funeral when this person is buried and uh, they're obviously going to go to a pub to have a drink 
and he's saying, well, we'll, we'll have the first round in Dumfries Pub. That's what he's saying. First round Dumfries, Mr. Dallas said, nodding. Gordon Bennett Cup. Gordon Bennett Cup. That could mean anything. It could mean um, Gordon Bennett Cup. It could mean I'm going to have stout beer, you know, lard or whatever. <sighs> That's what he's more or less saying. But he, he started thinking about having the first round of drinks in Dumfries Pub. Uh, reading on. Praise be to God, Merton Cunning said piously. Born upset, a coffin bumped out on the road, bust open. Paddy Dignam shot out and rolling over stiff in the dust in a brown habit too. Large for him, red face, grey now, mouth fallen open. Asked what, what's up now, quite right to close it, looks horrid open. Then the, then the insides decompose quickly. Much better to close up all the offices. Yes, also would wax the... Uh, Sprincher loose seal all up. So we know that. Yeah. So first round Dumfries, Mr. Dallas said nodding. God have been a cup. Praise be to God, Merton, Merton Cunningham said. So he said, praise be to God, we'll have a drink. That's what he's more or less saying. Now Leopold Bloom has started thinking here again. Borden, uh, no, uh, sorry, bomb, upset. That's what he's thinking in his mind. Um, a coffin bumped out onto the road, bust open. He's just he's visualizing if Paddy Dignam, and he's thinking in his mind if Paddy Dignam, you know, f coffin fell out on the road, this is what would happen. Bomb upset. He's thinking if this coffin, uh, this carriage is in now, if this coffin come out, fell out on the road. Bomb upset. The coffin will will be ups you know it'll be upset and it'll fall on the road. A coffin bumped out on the road, burst open. If the coffin burst open, Paddy if Paddy Dignam shot out. And rolling over stiff in the dust in a brown habit to alert for him. Red face. You know he's had a red face. But now he's grey now. His face will be grey now because he's dead. Mouth. And his mouth fallen open. His mouth will fall open. Asking what's up now. He'll be asking what's up now. He's, you know, quite right to close it. And then he's thinking, they're quite right to close a, a person that dies mouth. It looks horrid open. Then the insides decompose quickly. Now he's thinking about a body in general. Uh, the insides decompose quickly. Much is, and then he's thinking it's much better to close up all the offices, you know, all the openings. Yes, also with wax. The hincher, I can't pronounce that word, loose, seal all up. <laughs> seal all up. Um, uh, reading on. Dumfries, Mr. Power announced as the carriage turned right. Dumfries Corner. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. A pause by the wayside. Tip top position for a pub. I expect we'll pull up here on the way back to drink his health. Pass round the consolation. Elixir of life. But suppose now it did happen. Would he bleed if a nail, say, cut him in the knocking about? He would and he wouldn't, I suppose. Depends on where the circulation stops. Still some might ooze out of an artery. It would be better to bury them in red, a dark red. Uh, reading over that again. So, Dumfries, Mr. Power announced at the carriage turn right. So, they have turned a corner here, uh, and there's a pub here at the corner called Dumfries. Uh, so, they're just passing Dumfries pub, and Mr. Power's announced, Dumfries, we're passing Dumfries pub now. Dumfries, Mr. Power announced at the carriage turn right. Dumfries corner, yeah, here we are. Dumfries corner, they, they also call this Dumfries corner. Morning coaches drawn up, uh, morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. So coaches, there were horse coaches and buggies that were already at the cemetery, and they, you know, the person had been buried. So now they have all pulled up outside this pub and they're going in to have a drink, um, which is common enough here in Ireland when a person dies, people usually go to the pub to have a drink <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> um, back then they did too. Morning. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. So, morning coaches, they're morning, and you know they're they're in there drinking now. A pause by the wayside. Now this is Leopold Bloom thinking. A p it's a this is a pause by the wayside. Tip top position for a pub. Then he's thinking this is a f this is a fantastic great position for a pub right here, right beside the cemetery because everybody will you know tip top position for a pub, an excellent position for a pub. That's what he's saying or thinking sorry expect we'll pull up here on the way back to drink his health now he's thinking yes i expect we're going to stop here for a drink on the way back to drink his health P 
pass around the constellation elixir of life passed around the constellation um that were probably referred to in them times that might have passed around a hat like taking a collection for the wife and children possibly passed around the con uh, constellation elixir of life but suppose now it did happen now he starts thinking again if the coffin came out on the road and Paddy Dignam, you know, uh, you know, fell out of the coffin. But suppose now it did happen. Would he bleed if a nail, say, cut him in the knocking about? Now he's thinking about Paddy Dignam's body. Would he's, would he bleed if a nail, if a nail, say, cut him in the knocking about? So if a nail cut his body, would he bleed? He would. He's thinking he would, and he wouldn't. That's the real Irish expression. Uh, he would, and he wouldn't. Um, that's what he's thinking. I suppose. Depends on where. Depends on where the nail cut him. And then he's thinking the circulation stops. Still, some might ooze out of an artery. <laughs> this is Jice and he's. <laughs> this is Jice. I was definitely laughing as he was writing this, without a doubt. Still, some might ooze out of an artery. Is this what he's thinking? It would be better to bury them in red, a dark red. Now, why does he say it was better to bury them in red? Like a red coffin or whatnot. Because if blood did seep out, you wouldn't see the blood. It would be better to bury them in red, like a red coffin, or it could be a red cloak, whatever. Dark red. Because if blood did seep out, you wouldn't see it. Uh, great writing, Joyce, of course, again. Um, uh, reading on. In silence they drove along Philsborough Road. An empty hearse trotted by, coming from the cemetery, looks relieved. Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. Water rushed roaring through the sluices. A man stood on his dropping barge. Between clamps of turf on the town path by the lock, a slack tethered horse aboard of the Bugaboo. <laughs> Bugaboo. Their eyes watched him on the slow, weedy waterway he'd floated on the raft. Uh, actually, let me cut through them uh, three or four lines before, because that's the start of another page. Excuse me. Right. Uh, it would be better to bury them in red, a dark red. Um, in silence they drove along Philsborough Road. So Joyce has entered in here again, uh, the writer. So the carriages drove along Philsborough Road. An empty hearse trotted by. So an empty hearse, tr uh, you know, trotted by them, obviously coming from the cemetery. An empty hearse because, the, you know, the coffin is has been buried. An empty hearse trotted by, coming from the cemetery, looks relieved. The driver looks relieved. Uh, that's what that probably refers to. Uh, uh, maybe the horses too. <laughs> if I said the, the driver. Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. So now they're passing Cross Guns Bridge and the Royal Canal. Um, the Royal Canal. Actually, Brendan Behan um, uh, wrote a very famous song here in Dublin. Brendan Behan, the Irish playwright. Um, uh, the old triangle was the name of the song and he mentioned the royal canal in it uh, that was one of the prominent uh, lines in it the royal canal you know brendan behan is a very famous irish playwright here he was also um uh, he, was, uh, he didn't have very much school in brendan at all he was actually a house painter um you know um and a fantastic playwright um if but that was his trade he was a he was a house painter um um Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. Yeah, he wrote a very famous song. Uh, the Old Triangle is a very famous song here in Ireland, and the Royal Canal is mentioned a good few times. Uh, reading on, water rushed, water rushed, roaring through the sluices. Um, a man stood on his dropping barge between clamps of turf. So, in the times there was barges. Uh, 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 barges were. Uh, I know that the, there was a lot of rivers there, you know, like canals, and the you know a horse would pull like a boat, uh, you know, a boat along 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 the canals, you know, and transport, you know, transporting goods and people and whatnot, and um, but at certain uh, certain into you know areas, you know, every mile or every two or three miles, there'd be a barge. Now I don't know the ins and outs of all this, but uh, a man stood on his dropping barge. It'd be something like it, it, the water would be high and then on the other side of the barge uh, it would be a lot lower. So I think uh, the barge would have to wait there and the water would drop and then the boat would drop, you know, so on and so forth. Something along them lines. Visualize like, is it the Suez Canal? Uh, 
uh, where you know the boards drop down and it's that kind of a concept I think a man stood on his dropping beard so the beard he's he the man in this beard which is like a large boat um, and it's dropping down so he's waiting there for the water to drop on the other side or what not a man stood on a dropping beard between clamps of turf so this barge is carrying this boat you know barge boat whatever is carrying you know clamps of turf he's car is carrying a l you know uh, piles of turf basically on the town path on the town path by the lock so the lo at every at intervals in this canal there's a like a what they call a lock and it you know i think the boat drops down and you know they let release water and oh, that whole concept i think so on the town path by the lock a slack tethered horse so this is the horse that pulls this barge the boat and he's slack tethered this is very important slack tethered so he's his 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 legs are tethered, you know, with a rope, um, a rope tied onto, you know, possibly the front legs or back legs, but it's it's they're not um, they're not uh, the ropes are the rope is pretty loose. It's slack to allow him to you know to allow him you know to step you know step uh, you know uh, to walk, but also but not to kind of run if you know what I mean. Slack tethered horse board of the bugaboo a board of the bugaboo a board of the bugaboo I'm not sure about that um it could be possibly the name of the bird so the name is I'm reading on their eyes watched him on the slow weedy waterway he'd floated on his raft coastward 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 over Ireland drawn by a haulage rope past beds of reeds over slime, mud, mud choked bottles, carrying dogs at Lone Mullingar, my valley. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal or cycle down, hire some old croc safety. Um, Rin had won the other day at the auction, but a lady's developing waterways, James McCann's hobby to row me, to row me o'er the ferry, cheaper transit. By easy stages, houseboats, camping out, also hearses to heaven by water. Perhaps I will without writing, come as a surprise, leak slip, clancilla, dropping down lock by lock to Dublin with turf from the Midland bogs. Salute, he lifted his brown straw hat, saluting Paddy Dignam. Um, so now that's just a paragraph of writing there, and you know, it seems there's not much in it, but um. When you actually analyze this, there's so much content in this, you know, this small paragraph here. Um, there's just so much content, it's unbelievable, you know. Um, so, going over now. Their eyes watched him. So, the four people in the carriage, Leopold Bloom, Mr. Mer um, Mr. Dallas, uh, Merton Cunningham, and the other person, are watching this uh, person, the bear. Their eyes watched him. So, they're watching, the, you know, the bear. On the slow weedy waterway he had floated on his on the s on the slow weedy on this is great imagery from Joyce on the slow weedy waterway he had floated on his raft coastward o coastward over Ireland drawing by a haulage rope past beds of reeds over slime mud choke bottles carrying dogs um um they could be referring to this this bear here but or uh, barge in general um but it's it's about a barge here that would be traveling in the different canals and you know going to different parts of ireland um, i'm not sure in particular which barge uh, it is aboard of the bugaboo you know um their eyes watched him on the slow weedy the weedy waterway visualize the, the waterway and it's full of weeds coming up he had floated on his raft he had floated on his raft Coastward, coastward over Ireland, drawn by a haulage rope, that's the horse, past beds of reeds, past beds of reeds, over slime, that's all in the water, mud choked bottles, uh, great image from Joyce, mud choked bottles, bottles mud choked, carrying dogs, Atlone, Mullingar, My Valley, these are places in Ireland, Atlone is a place in Ireland, Mullingar is, My Valley is another place in Ireland. I could make a walking tour. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal. So Leopold Blow now was thinking about his daughter Millie who was down in Mullingar. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal. He could go down and visit her. 
he already uh, said he might earlier on in the book. Or cycle down. He's thinking, or will I cycle down? Hire some old crock safety. Hire, hire some old crock. Um, but in Ireland, that's a very common expression here in Ireland. They say, you know, uh, like an old bike is called an old crock. Um, um, like an old, you know, an old bike that's not, and it wouldn't be a new bike. Hire an old, it's, it's called an old crock. Hire some old crock safety. He's thinking about if I hired an old, if I hired out an old old crack of a bike and cycled down there. Rin had one the other day at the auction. Rin, so a uh, person called Rin, that's his surname, had a bike the other day at an auction, but a lady's, but it was a lady's bike. A uh, difference between a lady's bike and a men's bike, but it was a lady's bike. Developing waterways. Now he's thinking about Ireland in general, they're developing waterways, you know, like canals and whatnot. James McKenna's hobby to roam me over the ferry. Uh, so he knows the person called Jane McKen and he likes the waters. It's water it seems. Now he's thinking it's cheaper transit. You know, uh, barges and boats is cheap. You know, cheaper transit by easy stages. And houseboats. He's also thinking about this. Yes, there's houseboats. There's you know boats on these canals where people live in them. Camping out. It's like camping out. Also hearses. Um, they may bring, you know, hearses. Um, they may bring, you know, coffins and whatnot on these barges. To heaven by water. <laughs> to heaven by water. <laughs> if you were, you know, a hearse. If you were um, in a coffin, you know, going on the water. To heaven by water. Perhaps I will without writing. Now he's thinking. Perhaps I will visit my daughter Millie without writing. Without telling her I'm coming. Come as a surprise. I go there as a surprise. Leaks and Leak Slip, Clansilla. Now these are two places in Dublin, Leak Slip and Clansilla. This is the way he's he's gonna he's thinking he will go down there. Dropping down uh, yeah, he's now he's thinking about going on these barges down to Mullingar, dropping down lock by lock to Dublin. Uh that's more or less what's going on there. With turf from the Midland bogs. Uh leaks come as surprise, dropping down lock by lock to Dublin. With turf from the Midland Bogs, so obviously in these barges they bring turf from you know the middle, the Midland Bogs, you know from different parts of Ireland. They bring bo you know turf on these and to different parts of Ireland, you know Dublin probably. Salute. He lifted his salute. No, salute, salute. No, he probably put up his hand at the person in the barge. He probably waved at him. He saluted him. Another w another way of saying it. He saluted him. Leopold Bloom probably saluted him. Uh, he lifted his brown hat, saluting. So the person in the beard lifted his brown straw hat, saluting, and he saluted Paddy Dignam because he saluted the carriage because you know he lifted you know he lifted his brown hat. Uh, the person in the beard lifted his brown hat, you know, saluting Paddy Dignam, the person that had died. Basically, uh, reading on, they drove on past Brian Bar. Him he house near it now. I wonder how their friend Fogarty getting on, Mr. Power said. Better ask Tom Kiernan, Mr. Dallas said. How is that, Merton Cunningham said. Left him weeping, I suppose. T uh, um. uh, though lost to sight, Mr. Dallas said to memory, dear, the carriage steered left for Fingless Road, the stone colours yard on the right, less lap. Crowned on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared, white, sorrowful, holding out came hands, knelt in grief, pointing fragments of shapes, hoon, in white silence, appealing, the best obtainable, Thomas H. Denary, Denary, oh, the light is not very good in here, Denary, monumental builder and sculpture, past. Uh, so reading over that again, they drove on past Brian Bar M Hayes' house um, near it now. So Leopold Bloom was thinking near we're near now. They're past the certain house, and he said we're near the cemetery now. So someone has spoke here. I wonder how is our friend Fogarty getting on? Mister Power said. So Mister Power said this. Better ask Tom Kiernan, Mister Dallas said. So he, you know inquired about a person called Fogarty. How is that, Merton Cunningham said, left him weeping, I suppose. How is that, Merton Cunningham said, left him weeping, I suppose. Not sure about that. Um, though lost to sight, 
Mr. Dallas said to memory dear. I'm not sure about that. I'll have to think about that more. The carriage steered left for Fingless Road. So the carriage is going along Fingless Road or towards Fingless Road. Um, the stone cutters yard on the right. So on the right here they see uh, a person that makes like headstones and all that. Um, you know headstones for the cemetery. The stone cutters yard on the right. Last lap. Leopold Bloom is thinking this is the last lap of this journey. Crowned on the spit, crowned on the spit of of land, silent shapes appeared. Crowned on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared. What are they? They are headstones. Th now they start to see headstones, white, sorrowful, holding out cam hands. These are you know designs on the headstones. Knelt in grief, um, pinting. These are all the headstones. Fragments of shapes, headstones, hoon. Now, um. Actually, these are in the stone cars here. These are not actually in the cemetery yet. In white, or you know, um, they could be in boats actually. In white silence, in white silence appearing, the best obtainable Thomas H. Dinany monumental builder and, scal and sculpture. So this is the name of the person that has the stone cars yard. Is is you know th that's his name. Passed. Um, so they must have passed it. Reading on on the curved stone before Jimmy Geary Geary the sexton, Jimmy Geary the sexton's an old tramp sat grumbling, emptying the dirt and stones out of his huge dust brown yawning boat after life's journey. Gloomy gardens. Uh, hang on a second, I'm not having a hard job seeing this here now. Um, uh, where are we at all at all? Gloomy gardens then went by one by one. Gloomy houses. Mr. Power, Mr. Power pointed. That is where Childs was murdered. He said the last house. So it is, Mr. Dallas said. A gruesome case. Same Aunt Bush got him off. Murdered his brother, or so they said. The Crown had no evidence. Mr. Power said. Only circumstantial. Martin Cunningham said. That's the maxim of the law. Better for ninety-nine guilty to escape than for one innocent person to be wrongfully condemned. <laughs> Uh, so reading on there, uh, going back over that again. On the curved stone before Jimmy Geary's. Um, Jimmy Geary is a sexton, so I don't know what a sexton is actually. Um, but on the curved stone before Jimmy Geary's a sexton, um, this is a person, you know, whatever he is, uh, building. An old tramp sets, an old tramp sitting down. Gr he's grumbling, of course. Emptying the dirt. <laughs> grumbling. I've got Jay's throwing the grumbling there. Emptying the dirt and stones of his huge dust brown yawning boat. That's great writing, my guys. So this tramp is sitting down and he's 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 emptying dirt and stones of his huge dust brown dust brown dust brown from walking all the time. Yawning boat. Why did they say yawning boat? Because it's like the boat the boat has been is relieved to be taken off and getting a bit of fresh air. More or less, I'd say, you know. After life's journey, gloomy gardens then went by one by one. Gloomy houses, so they're passing gloomy gardens and gloomy what look like gloomy houses. Mister Power, Mister Power, pointed. That is where Childs was murdered. He said the last house. So they're passing. They're coming close to a house, and there was somebody called Childs murdered there. So it is, Mister Dallas said, a gruesome case. Same Aunt Bush got him off. That that would be the uh, solicitor. Um, so it is, Mr. Dallas said, a gruesome case. Same on Bush got him off. That would be the solicitor, or the say in America, the, the liar, the lawyer. Same on Bush got, o got him off, murdered his brother. Uh, so he must have murdered his brother, this child, or so they said. The Crown had no evidence, Mr. Power said. The Crown, uh, meaning the Crown, meaning in England, uh, that's what the Crown means. The Crown had no evidence, Mr. Power said. Only circumstantial, Martin Cunningham said. That's the maxim of the law. Better, f it's better for ninety-nine percent guilty to escape <laughs> than for one innocent person to be wrong wrongfully condemned. Um, humor, great humor from Jace again. Um, reading on, they looked murderer's ground. It passed darkly, shuttered, tenant tenantless, unweeded garden. garden. Whole place gone to hell, wrongfully condemned. Murder, the murderer's image in the eye of the murdered. They love reading about it. Um, let me go over that now because I'm about to turn the page here now. 
The Crown had no evidence Mr. Power said, only circumstantial. Martin Cunningham said, that's the maximum law. Better for 1990. Yeah, I read that. They looked, uh, um, they looked murderer's ground. So this is the house where the person was murdered. Mur it's a murderer's ground. It passed darkly. So the passing by, and it's like a dark, gloomy place. Shuttered. The house is shuttered up. You know, the windows are shuttered up. Tenantless. There's no, it's tenantless. There's nobody living there. Unweeded garden. You see the way Jice captures everything about this house. Shuttered, tenantless, unweeded garden. It's unweeded garden. There's nobody living there. Whole place gone to hell. Wrongfully condemned. Um, murder. <laughs> now this is a great line coming up from Jice. The murderer's image in the eye of the murderers. Uh, in the you know vision. If you think about that, the murderer's image in the eye of the murdered because the person is about to be murdered he would that's the last thing you would see the murderer's image in the eye of the murderer uh, so Leopold Bloom has started uh, thinking here now they love reading about it man's head found in a garden this is, uh, let me read on they love reading about it man's head found in a garden her clothing consisted of how she met her death recent outrage the weapon used, murderer is still at large, clues, a shoelace, the body to be exhumed, murder will out. Cramped in this carriage, she mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. Must be careful about women, catch them once with their pants down, never forgive you after fifteen. The high railings of prospects rippled past their gaze, dark poplars, rare white forms, forms more frequent, white shapes thronged amid the trees. White forms and fragments streaming by mutely sustaining vain gestures in the air. Uh, so, reading back over that again. So, the murderer's image in the eye of the murderer. That's just a brilliant line from Jais. There, that's that's another, that's another example of you know writing as a as opposed to storytelling. That is writing at its best. The murderer's image in the eye of the murderer. Th now, Leopold Bloom has started thinking here. They love reading about it. He's talking about people in general love reading about murder. They love reading about it. Ma and now he's thinking about what they would be reading about. Men's head found in a garden. <laughs> her clothing consisted of how she met her death, recent outrage, these are the headlines, the weapons used, murder is still at large, clues, a shoelace, the body to be exhumed, murder will out. Murder will out. Um, so, just... Uh, Jais captures the whole picture there again. Cramped in this carriage. Uh, so Leopold Bloom and I was thinking, it's very cramped in this carriage. There's not much room, more or less. She mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. So now he's thinking about his wife, Molly Bloom. She, if he was to pop into the house unexpected, you know, or whatever, she mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. So she probably Molly Bloom doesn't like him going into his, his own house without she knowing he's coming it seems she mightn't like me to come that way without without letting her know so his house is not far away from this cemetery possibly and he was thinking about after the funeral he might you know go in there and so that's going must be and then he's thinking you must must be careful about about women yeah he's more saying you must be careful with women <laughs> must be careful about women uh catch them once with their pants down never forgive you after 15 <laughs> how true is it? oh that's very true isn't it uh must be careful about women you must be careful with women more or less catch the ones with their pants down they'll never forgive you after 15 um i don't know what he means by 15 there to be honest uh catch the ones with the pants down never forgive you 15 um uh, you probably have to think about that, listeners. You know, fif fif what does he mean by 15 there? Um, the high railings of prospects rippled past their gaze. Um, that's a great line of writing from Jay there again. Um, and actually, I remember reading a poem once. Uh, reading a poem once about... Basically, the poem kind of was about a person that was in a train and he was... He was looking at telegraph poles, and as the trains, you know, sped up and got faster, the telegraph poles, you know, were moving faster. T t t t now, um, you can see here, uh, this is exactly 
Jice wrote this in the early 1900s. It's the same concept. The high railings of prospects ripple past their gaze. So visualize the railings, I mean like a steel railing, and you know the pints and the railing. The high railings of prospects ripple past their gaze as they're as they're driving along in this in the horse. Uh, it's like the same same thing. They're rippling a past. The high railings of prospects ripple past their gaze. Uh, so they're moving and the. It's like the the tops of the ra uh, of of these pinty rails are rippling past their gaze. That's another uh, example of great writing from Joyce. The high railings of prospects rippled past their gaze. So they are travelling at a bit of speed in this carriage, and it's like these the 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 peaks of this uh, of the steel railings. You know, the little the p all the peaks are rippling past their gaze. Dark poplars, um, which are trees, I think. Rare white forms. Rare white forms. Um, I'm not sure of these rare white forms. Forms more frequent. Um, now he's coming in here, uh, and the, the I think he sees all the um, he sees all the headstones in the cemetery. Um, dark poplars, rare white forms. Now that could possibly be could be referring to the trees, or could be referring to uh, the like. So headstones forms more frequent white shapes thronged white shapes thronged amid the trees i would say this i would be inclined to think that they are the headstones uh, that he sees these uh, headstones uh, you know over these graves you know inside you know between the trees white shapes thronged amid the trees white forms and fragments streaming by mutely sustaining vain gestures in there i think that's what's going on there uh reading on the filly harshened against the curbstone stopped merton cunningham put out his arm and wrenching back and wrenching back the handle shoved the door open with his knee he stepped out mr power and mrs ellis followed changed that soap now mr bloom's hand unbuttoned his hip pocket swiftly and transferred the paper stuck soap to his inner handkerchief pocket he stepped out of the carriage, replacing the newspaper his other hand still held. Paltry funeral, coach and three carriages, it's all the same. Pallbearers, gold reins, wreck your mess, firing a volley, pomp of death. Beyond the hind carriage, a hawker stood by. His barrow of cakes and fruit, similar cakes though they are, stuck together, cakes for the dead, dog biscuits. Who ate them? Mourners coming out. He followed his companions, Mr. Kiernan and Ned Lampert followed, Hines walking after them. Corny Kelleher stood by the opened hearse and took out the two reeds. He handed one to the boy. Where is that child's where where is that child's funeral disappeared to? So I'm reading over that again. The filly uh, the um, the filly harshened against the curbstone stopped. Uh, so the this is the carriage coming to a stop at the f at the uh, at the entrance to this cemetery. Uh, Merton Cunningham put out his arm out of the the carriage window, and wrenching back, so he wrenched back the handle uh, from outside, shoved the door open with his knee. So he shoved the door open with his knee. He stepped out of the carriage. Mr. Power and Mr. Ellis followed him out. Change that soap now, Mr. Bloom. Change that soap now. Mi so. Leopold Bloom, if you remember uh, previously, when he got in the carriage, the soap was kind of underneath his um, underneath his leg, and he didn't want to change it because it was too awkward. And he didn't want people to see him in the carriage doing it. So now that they've all left the carriage, uh, he says he's going to change. Cha I'll change that soap now. Change that soap now, Mr. Bloom. Mr. Bloom's hand unbuttoned his unbuttoned his hip pocket swiftly, and transferred the paper stuck soap to his inner handkerchief. Uh, see another example of the preciseness of Joyce's writing and transfer the paper stuck soap so it's the reason it's stuck it's paper stuck because of the heat of his body uh, you know sitting on this uh, soap and transfer the paper stuck soap to his inner handkerchief pocket he stepped out of the carriage so now he stepped out of the carriage replacing the newspaper his other hand still held you see oh, how precise Joyce is with his writing it's just incredible Paltry funeral. Um, so now Leopold Bloom, I think, has started thinking here again, and he's he's looking around. This is a paltry funeral, coach and three carriages. So it's just a coach and three carriages, um, 
at the funeral it seems uh, I thought it was only two carriages but it seems like there could be three carriages now he's thinking it's all the same um, like you more think is saying or it's more is thinking that every funeral is the same it's all the same Paul bears this Paul bears the gold rings there's a wrecking mess firing a volley some is <laughs> firing a volley a volley is like a firing of shots over you know if someone dies in the army they fire a volley of shots P it's the pomp of death beyond the hind carriage now beyond the hind the one of the carriages a hawker stood by his barrow of cakes and fruit so a hawker there's somebody here selling as a barrow and he's selling cakes and fruit a hawker he's to call him a hawker he's just like a seller he's selling cakes and fruit you know for the people going to the cemetery or whatnot similar cakes those are so he's selling cakes they're called similar cakes stuck together cakes for the dead there's a Le Leo leopold boom is thinking here again they're stuck together uh cakes for the dead dog biscuits <laughs> um uh, leo pablo was thinking there these these cakes don't taste nice they remind you of dog biscuits they remind the biscuits you give to a dog they're not they're not nice basically who ate them mourners coming out or who ate them like mourners coming out he eats them that's what he's thinking he fought now reading on he followed his companions mr kiernan and ned lampert followed heinz Walking after them, Corny Keller stood by the open hearth and took out the two reeds. Oh yeah, I read that. So he followed his companions, Mr. Kieran and Ned Lampert followed. Hines walking after them, Corny Keller stood by the open hearth and took out the two reeds. Two reeds, uh, reeds uh, at a funeral are like you know round, kind of a round thing, you know, made of uh, uh, you know flowers and whatnot. Um, people, you know, send wreaths, you know, or buy reeds, and you know, it's to decorate the grave basically. He handed one to the boy, so he handed one to a boy, uh, I would say the son of Paddy Dignam. What? Where is that child's funeral disappearedness? Disappeared to? So now Leopold Bloom is thinking here, the hearse that passed by with the with the small white coffin in it, he said, where is that child's funeral disappeared? Where did that go to? So now he's thinking about that uh, young child that passed by. And he said, where is that child's funeral disappeared to? So he's obviously looking around. Read on. A team of horses passed from Fingless with tiling, plodding, red. A, a team of horses passed from Fingless with tiling, plodding, red, dragging through the funeral silence a creaking wagon on which lay a granite block. The wagoner marching at their heads saluted. Coffin now got here before, as dead as he is, horse looking round at it with his plume ski always dull eye collar tight on his neck pressing on a blood vessel or something do you know what they cart out here every day or do they know what they cart out here every day must be 20 or 30 funerals every day then mount jerome for the protestants funerals all over the world everywhere every minute shoveling them under by the cart load by the car is it car yeah cart load double quick thousands every hour too many in the world so reading over that again where is that child's funeral disappear to? So Leopold Bloom is thinking that. So a team of horses passed from Fingless with tiling plodding red. With tiling plodding red. Dragging through the funeral silence a creaking wagon. So there's a team of horses here, probably four horses here. And uh, this is a great image from Jai. So uh, dragging through the funeral silence, the silence of this funeral in this creaking wagon and why is the wagon creaking because on this wagon there's a which lay a large granite block so there's a like a large headstone on this creaking wagon and that's the reason it's creaking and that's the reason that uh, it needs a team of horses of probably four horses to pull it a team of horses passed from fingers with tiling plodding so it because it's heavy red Dragging through the funeral silence, a creaking wagon on which lay a granite block. A granite block for, a, you know, obviously for a headstone. The wagoner marching at their heads saluted. So, the, the you know, the person that's leading these horses, you know, he saluted, you know, Paddy, you know, uh, all the people at Paddy Dignan's funeral. Uh, coffin now. Now, Leopold Bloom has started thinking here again. Coffin now. And he's thinking, got here before us, the coffin got here before us, dead as he is. <laughs> the coffin got here as dead as he is, he's thinking. 
horse looking around at it with his plume skew away. So the horse is looking around at the coffin. There's a Leop Leopold Bloom is thinking all this, you know. And he's thinking, dull eye, he's got a dull eye. And the collar on that horse is tight on his neck. It's pressing on a ve blood vessel or something. Um, you know, the horse's collar. And then he's thinking, do they know what they cart out here every day? So Leopold Bloom is thinking, do these horses know what they cart out here every day? Must be 20 or 30. And then he's thinking, there must be 20 or 30 funerals every day. Then Mount Jerome for the Protestants. So Mount Jerome is is a cemetery, I'd say, for the Protestants. He's thinking, then Mount Jerome for the Protestants, where the Protestants bury their people. And then he's thinking, there's funerals all over the world everywhere, every minute. Shoveling them under by the cartload, double quick. That's what he's thinking. Uh, thousands every hour, you know, funerals. Just two, and he's thinking, too many in the world. Reading on. Mourners came out through the gate, woman and girl, lean-jawed, harpy, hard woman at a bargain, her bonnet awry, girl's face stained with dirt and tears, holding the woman's arm, holding the woman's arm, looking up at her for a sigh, for a sign to cry, fish's face, bloodless and livid. Um, yeah, going over that now there again. Uh, shoveling them under by the cartload double quick, thousands every hour, too many in the world. Mourners come out through the gates. So these are mourners coming out from the gates. They're after burying somebody. A woman and a girl, pr uh, probably they buried their husband. She buried her husband and a girl, the daughter. Lean jawed, happy. Lean jawed. So the woman here is lean jawed, happy. Hard woman at a bargain. So Leopold Bloom possibly knows this woman. Uh, oh no no no! Uh, Morris came out through the gates. Now this could be the wife here of uh, Paddy Dignam actually, and the daughter. Um, Morris came out through the gates. Woman and a girl, lean jawed, happy. Hard woman at a bargain. So this she the hard woman at a bargain. Uh, this this woman. Her bonnet awry, her bonnet of the awry, or ha or hat. Girl's face stained with dirt and tears. So the girl's face is stained with dirt and tears. That's great image from Joyce. Holding the woman's arm, she's holding her mother's arm, looking up at her for a sign to cry. Fish's face, bloodless and livid. So that's her face. It's like a fish's face. It's bloodless and livid. And anybody has ever been at a funeral? I'm sure most people have you would see that sometimes you would see you know younger people especially their whole face would be like pure bloodless and livid pure nearly pure white fish's face bloodless and livid uh Jace just captured that completely there um just one second now here let's have a look check the time okay um just one second now should I drink a tea here <coughs> So, uh, reading on now. The mutes shoulder the coffin. The mutes shoulder the coffin and bore it through the gates. So much dead weight. Felt heavier Felt heavier myself stepping out of the bat. First the stiff, then the friends of the stiff. Corny Keller and the boy followed with their wreaths. Who is that? Who is that beside them? Eh, the brother-in-law all walked after. Merton Cunningham whispered, I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom. What, Mr. Power whispered? How so? His father pithed himself, Merton Cunning whispered. Had the Queen's Hotel in Innes. You heard him say he was going to clear anniversary. Oh, God, Mr. Power whispered. First I heard of it, pithed himself. He glanced behind him to where a face with dark thinking eyes followed towards the Cardinal's uh, mausoleum speaking. Was he insured, Mr. Bloom asked. So reading over that again. The mutes shoulder the coffin. So these are people that lift the coffin from the, uh, you know, the horse carriage into possibly a, a little, you know, um, building here. Um, so the mutes, the reason Jice here calls them the mutes because, you know, they don't speak, you know, basically. And uh, the mutes shoulder the coffin and bore it through the gate. And bore it, so they're lifting the coffin from this horse carriage and, you know, probably four people. So much dead weight. So the Leopold Bloom here is thinking here. So much dead weight. Dead weight because the body is dead. Get it? <laughs> so much dead weight. Uh, felt heavier myself stepping out of the bed. So Leopold Bloom is thinking here. I felt heavier myself when I stepped out of the bed earlier in the day. 
First the stiff, now he's singing. First the stiff, the body, then the friends of the stiff, friends of, uh, of, the, of the body. Corny, Cal Corny Keller and the boy followed. This is the son of Paddy Dignam, I'd say, with their wreaths. Uh, you know, the wreaths, the flowery things, the round things are carrying. Who is that beside him? Now, there's somebody beside him, and Leopold Bloom is singing. Who is that beside him? Uh, the the brother in law, oh, that's the brother in law, uh, the wife's brother, right? All way, all walked after. So all the other mourners are walking after them. The first the coffin didn't leave people, and they are walking after them. Merton Cunningham whispered. So Merton Cunningham has qu whispered to one of the other people, "I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom." So remember the conversation earlier in the carriage when they were talking about suicide. Merton Cunningham has whispered to Mr. Power, "I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom." What, Mr. Power whispered? How so? His father poisoned himself, Merton Cunningham whispered. So, this is the reason why there was a bit of hesitation uh, from Merton Cunningham and he was trying to shut, well, tell them to be quiet in the carriage because now we have, uh, it's been uh, verified here that uh, Leopold Bloom's father did commit suicide. Um, um, I was a mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom. What, Mr. Powers whispered? How so? His father pies himself. So Leopold Bloom's father pies himself. Baron Cunning whispered, had, had the Queen's Hotel in Innes. So he pies in himself uh, in, 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 a, in a place, Innes is the place in Ireland here, in uh, Innes in County Clare, I think. County Clare will be next to uh, uh, the west of Ireland here. Uh, at, uh, in, in the, in so he committed Leopold Bloom's father committed suicide in the Queen's Hotel in Innes. You heard him say he was going to cl yeah County Clare. I was right. Look at that. He was sa you heard he him had a good friend from uh, County Clare, and in, in London. Um, um, you heard him say he was going to Clare anniversary. So, Marion Cunningham was said to Mister Power. You heard him say so. Leopold Bloom remember remember he said he was going to Clare uh, for some on a, some business. So Merton Cunningham has surmised here, I guess, that it's he's going there for the anniversary of his father's death. Oh God, Mr. Power whispered, first I, he I heard of it, poisoned himself. Um, read now. He glanced behind him to where a face with dark thinking eyes followed towards the Car Cardinal's mausoleum speaking. Um, so th the other two people in the carriage didn't know that f uh, Leopold Bloom's father had committed suicide. The only one that knew was Merton Cunningham. And he was trying to shush them up and, you know, they continued talking about it. Um, oh God, Mr. Bar was the first I heard of it, in himself. He glanced behind him to where a face with dark thinking eyes followed towards the Cardinal's mausoleum. So they're bringing the coffin into this kind of a small mausoleum, which is a small building, before the it goes off to be buried, speaking. Was he insured, Mr. Bloom asked. So Mr. Bloom uh, has asked somebody, was he insured? Um, I believe so, Mr. Kieran answered, but the policy was heavily mortgaged. Merton is, is trying to get the youngest into our ten. How many children did he leave? Five, Ned Lamper said. Says, uh, five, Ned Lamper says he'll try to get one of the girls into Todd's. A sad case, Mr. Bloom said gently, five young children. A great blow to his poor wife, Mr. Kieran added. Indeed, yes, Mr. Bloom agreed. Has the less, has the l has the left at him now. He looked down at the boots he had blackened and polished. She had outlived him, lost her husband, more dead for her than for me. One must outlive the other. Wise men say there are more women than men in the world. Condo condole with her, your terrible loss. I hope you'll soon follow him. For Hindu widows only, she would marry another. Him, no. Yet, who knows after widowhood not the thing since the old queen died drawn on a gun carriage victoria and albert frogmore memorial morning but in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet vain in her heart of hearts all for a shadow console not even a king her son was the substance something new to hope for not like the past she wanted back waiting it never comes one must go first alone under the ground and lie no more in our warm bed so reading over that again um okay was he insured was he insured mr bloom so mr bloom has asked somebody here uh was 
Pelly Dignam insured? Was there, you know, is there an insurance policy? I believe so, Mr. Kieran answered. I believe he was insured, but the policy was heavily, heavily mortgaged. So it was heavily mortgaged. So whatever money he's going to get on his death, it's, you know, you uh, won't get it all because it was heavily mortgaged. Merton is trying to get the young youngster into Ertain. So Merton, Merton Cunningham, possibly uh, as a friend, is trying to get one of Paddy Dignam's kids into Ertain, which is a school, Ertain school, I would say. And probably, you know, a pretty prestigious school, possibly. How, man, how many children did he leave? So Leopold Bloom was asking, how many children did, did Ned Lambert leave? Five. Five Ned Lambert, or no, or Paddy Dignam, sorry. Uh, five Ned Lambert said he'll try to get one of the girls into Taz. So he l this Paddy Dignam left five children. And Ned Lambert, you know, as a friendly gesture, is going to try and get one of the girls into Taz, which is another school. Uh, probably a good school as well. Um, so they're all going to help out the family and whatnot. A sad case, Mr. Bloom said gently. Five young children. A great blow to the poor wife, Mr. Kieran added. Indeed, yes, Mr. Bloom agreed. Has the less left at him now? So I think Leopold Bloom has uh, has the less left at him now. Is probably thinking that the wife has the less left at him for some reason. Because uh, she's outlived him or something. He looked down at the boots he had po uh, blackened and polished. Um, so Leopold Bloom is looking down at his, at his, at his boots. You know, he, po he had polished and blackened and whatnot. She had outlived him, lost her husband, uh, the wife, uh, more dead for her than me. Leopold Bloom is thinking, you know, this Paddy Dignam is more dead for her than me because she is the wife. One, and then he's thinking, one must now couples in general, husbands and wives, one must outlive the other. Wise men say. And then he's thinking, there are more women than men in the world. Um, this is what he's thinking. Um, con con condole with her. Now he's thinking, I must condole with her. Console her, you know, uh, after the funeral. Shake hands with her and say, sorry for your loss. Yeah, here we are. Your terrible loss. Uh, that's what that means. I hope you'll soon... And he's thinking, he's kind of thinking, imagine if I said to her, I hope you'll soon follow him. <laughs> So, you know, after this funeral, he shake hands with her and he says, sorry for your troubles and, you know, sad day and so on. And he's just thinking probably if he, if this slipped out, I hope you'll soon follow him. How silly that would sound. For Hindu widows only, uh, she would marry another. So he's, I think he's more of saying Hindu women can marry another when their husband dies, possibly. Him, no. Yet, who knows after. Widow... We, and now he's thinking, widowhood is not the same, is not the thing since the old queen died. So, possibly could be referring to Queen Victoria here. Drawn, and he's thinking about when, when she died, her, her funeral. She was drawn on a gun carriage, Victoria and Albert, who could be possibly um, sons and daughter, uh, son and a daughter of uh, the queen, if it's Queen Victoria. Uh, Frogmore Memorial Morning. Um not sure about that line um but in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet could be referring to queen victoria that she put a few violets in her bonnet because she i know she was grieving for her husband for years and towards the end i know i think she you know um wasn't grieving as much i, I think but in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet you know towards the end she wasn't as broken hearted it seems vain in her heart of hearts all for a shadow not really, you know, getting all that, but I need to spend more time with that. Consort, not even a king. Her son was the substance. Something new to hope, something new to hope for, not like the, like the past she wanted back, waiting, it never comes. Probably referring here to the queen, uh, if it's Queen Victoria, I would possibly say. One must go first. Now he's thinking of general, you know, husband and wife one must go first one must die first alone under the ground so that would be the person buried and lie no more in a warm bed uh, and would you know that person would ni uh, lie no more in their warm bed reading on how are you Simon Ned Lamper said softly clasping hands haven't seen you for a month of Sundays never better how are all in Cork's own town I was down there for the Cork Park races on Easter Monday, Ned Lamper said, same old six and eight pence, stop with Dick Tyvee. So reading that again, uh, one must go first, 
alone on the ground, a line of moral and moral. How are you, Simon? So Ned Lampert, as a uh, person called Ned Lampert, has you know said to Simon that uh, 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 how are you, Simon? How are you, Simon? Ned Lampert said softly. Um, how are you, Simon? So um, Ned Lampert says softly, clasping hands. Those are shaking hands. Haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. That's a real uh, expression here in Ireland. I haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. It means I haven't seen you for ages. I haven't seen you for a long time. I haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. Uh, very common expression in Ireland here. Never better. How are all in Cork so on town? Um, uh, how are they all down in, you know, Cork so on Down in Cork, some place in Cork. Which is a Cork is a place in Ireland here. Ca County Cork. I was down there for the Cork Park races on Easter Monday, which is probably horse races. Ned Lamper said, same old six and eight pence. That's the same thing happening down there, possibly. Stopped with Dick Tyvee, is it? And how was Dick the solid man? Nothing between himself and heaven, Ned Lamper answered. By the holy Paul, Mr. Dallas said in subdued wonder, Dick Tyvee bald. Merton is going up. Merton is going to get up a whip for the youngsters Ned Lamper said pinting ahead a few bob of skull just to keep the going till the insurance is cleared up yes yes Mr Dallas said dubiously is that the eldest son in front yes Ned Lamper said with the wise brother John Henry Menton is behind he put down his name for a quid I'll engage he did Mr Dallas said I often told poor Paddy he ought to mind that job John Henry is not the worst in the world how did he lose it Ned Lamper asked liquor what Many a good man's fault, Mr. Dallas said with a sigh. And how is Dick the solid man? Uh, reading back, nothing between himself and heaven. So this other person who said there's nothing between himself and heaven. Ned Lampert answered, by the holy Paul, Mr. Dallas said in subdued wonder, Dick Tyvee bald. So this is what he means by nothing between himself and heaven. He's bald, Dick Tyvee bald. Uh, nothing between himself and heaven. He's bald. Uh, reading on, Merton is going to get a whip up for the young youngsters. So Merton Cunningham, uh, Ned Lampert has said Merton Cunningham is going to get a whip up for the youngsters. So they're going to collect some money for, for the wife and the children, uh, you know, after this funeral possibly. Merton is going to whip, get up. Merton is going to get up a, a whip for for the youngsters. So I they're going to collect some money for the for the family here. Ned Lampert has said, pointing ahead, a few bob a skull. A few bob a skull, a few bob, a bob, uh, a few bob is that's m a monetary expression. A few shillings, a few, you know, pound, whatever. A few bob a skull, a skull means a person. A skull, a person's skull is there in their head, but uh, in sometimes here in Ireland they say a few bob a skull, it means a few bob a person. Just to keep them going till the insurance is cleared up. So they're going to collect some money to keep the family going until the insurance, to get the insurance money. Yes, yes, Mr. Dallas said jovially. Is that the eldest boy in front? So now he's looking. He sees, he's, and he's looking at a, uh, you know, a boy, and he said, "Oh, is that the eldest boy up there in front?" Yes, Ned Lamper said with the wives. He he's with the wise brother John. He's with the wise brother. John Henry Minton is behind him. He put down. He put down his name for a quid. So a quid is like a pound. So a pound was probably a lot of money in them times. So this John Henry Minton is going to, you know, give a pound to this collection. I'll engage he did, Mr. Dallas said. I often told poor Paddy he ought to mind that job. So Paddy Dignam possibly worked for the, or uh, did work for this John Henry Minton. I often told poor Paddy Dignam he ought to mind that job, mind the job he had with this John Henry Minton. John Henry is not the worst in the world. That's another real Irish expression here. John Henry is not the worst in the world. He's not a bad, you know, chap you know fellow you know whatever he's not the worst in the world uh, th that's what it means here uh, you say oh he's, n he's not the worst in the world it means he's not a bad f fellow s more or less how did he lose it so this uh petty dignam lost his job with john Henry Minton. how did he lose how did he lose his job ned lampard asked liquor what was it because of liquor was it because of the drink uh uh, how did he lose? So he lost his job. How did he lose it? Ned Lamper asked. Liquor, what? So uh, probably he was drinking. He wasn't showing up for work. He was drinking. Many a good man's fault, Mr. Dallas said with a sigh. 
so you know drink is the you know many a good man's fault it's the it's the downfall of a many a person he's more of a sin uh many a good man's fault mr s i um i'm gonna stop here now because i think i'm up to my limit here now um so just reading where do we get what do we do at all here is the sitting one and a half two and a half three and a half okay one two three four uh five one and a half two one two three four five we'll be nearly five and a half pages uh, possibly well anyways we're up to page 90 i've marked here um which is uh, not bad no not bad not bad at all we're doing all right um so there'll be probably two more uh, sections here uh, in this in this um in this uh, in this installment um it goes over a page of page uh, up to page 100 um but uh, just there briefly um uh, um anybody reading that now uh, you know uh, without listening to me you can really Joyce has really captured the whole funeral scene here and it's the imagery is just fantastic. I mean, uh, Joyce will put you right there at that funeral, uh, no doubt about it. And all the things that go on. And as we read on up here to over uh, up to page 102, this funeral continues, and there's a lot that happens in this funeral. It's just it's the imagery is fantastic, and and, and uh, uh, so much humour as well, you know. So I'm just going to sign off here now, and um. I'm not going to plug my book again, but you know, if anybody would like to uh, spread the word about that book, I would really appreciate it. And actually, just before I go, I would like to actually um, name out uh, name out my the short stories in that book, nine stories from Evanon, which is a link here from this recording. And the, na the nine, uh, the, as I said before, these nine short stories, they're also nine one act plays, as each story is is over ninety five percent dialogue and um they're you know they're this the book the whole book is practically all dialogue you know so uh the name of the short stories are the first of uh, which are actually I, I like to say the the one i play is uh so the first one i play is called roadworthy the second one is called job corruption the second uh and the third uh short story slash uh, one i play is called irish immigration the next one is called an irish funeral the next one is called merriment. The next one is called manipulation. The next one is called smoking. The next one is called brown paper bags. And the last short story slash one act play is called Evanon River. And the other two short the other two short stories slash one act plays I've also written a uh, one is called Stop Being So Fearful. And the last one is called Chinese Food. And now my two full in plays are called Desperations, which was actually staged out in New York in um uh, in the year 2000, as I said before, at a, a theatre called Theatre for New City. I got excellent reviews from the uh, Village Vice out there and also the Irish Vice newspaper and the Irish Echo newspaper uh, with a cast of el 11. Uh, that play, that's a full in play. It uh, a running time for that would be 1 hour 50 minutes. Uh, that's called Desperations. And my other full in play is called Behind Closed Doors, which is a play that's about uh, it's yeah it would be approximately one hour and 50 minutes also now behind closed doors i've that play i've that play written 10 years ago and also copyrighted from 10 years ago and that's my other full in play uh just the to my two full in plays are desperations and behind closed doors and th uh, the rest there are all my uh 11 one act plays and i was just actually adding up the total cast for all them plays actually is is the actually I, I was i said 80 before it's actually 87 87 characters and uh, so there's a hell of a lot of <coughs> excuse me there's a hell of a lot of um you know parts there for stage actors and actresses you know if i can get all these plays off the ground you know uh certainly a lot of you know a lot of people a lot of people can be go be, be put on stage you know it's not like these plays are not stageable i mean desperations was staged out in new york uh, and got fantastic reviews and there wasn't, um, you know, there was no hiccups with the dialogue on stage, and you know, um, it played for thirteen nights. So, um, anybody says, "Oh, well, it's not stageable," it already was staged, you know. So this, you know, this, this you can't, that cannot be denied. And also, behind closed doors is a fantastic play. I think it's very hugely entertaining, 
and all these as i said these uh, if people purchase that book um um and actually i think it might be a good idea if stage actors and actresses you know especially in the galway county area or galway as such because um very soon i'll be looking for a cast at 24 to act in um three one act plays uh 12 actresses and 12 actors um and the three the three one act, pl act plays that will be uh will be staged will be um will be uh will be seen in one second uh job corruption irish immigration and uh stop being so fearful um i'm going to think i think i'm going to combine that all into one one act play and the other one will be chinese food will be the second uh one one act play and the third one will be uh the third one i play is is what's uh, the other one an irish funeral there will be the three there will be the three uh the three um the three one act plays that i would like to uh, get staged first of all um uh, as I said, an overall cast of 24. And, you know, if people, you know, become acquainted or, or read them short stories from that book, Nine Stories from Heaven on, you know, they can, they can, th them are the lines that's going to be used on stage. So, you know, um, if they read the, if they're reading the dialogue there, them are the lines, them are the lines that will be used on stage. So the people get an, an idea of what the plays are about. And it may be a good idea, you know, if stage actors and actresses, you know, could, you know, if they could purchase that book and, you know, they'll read the lines from themselves, you know. And because, you know, s uh, very soon I'm going to get them three play a stage, you know. And um, that's about it. Now, I'm going to have to sign off for Monave here, the village of Monave. Um, and until the next, rec uh, the next recording... Um, I'd like to say goodbye and thank all listeners for um, tuning in, as they say. Goodbye.